if we can stay true to the vision of the founding fathers, so many references have been made today to that, uh, I guess that uh, relying uh, on those basic ideas, basic dreams, that it was first of all a peace project, uh, a democratic project, and I will get back to the many criticism that was uh, uh, addressed to the democracy aspect of the project, and the prosperity aspect, we can really believe in a bright future for the EU. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here, not only uh, because of the traditions of this place, but what a day it is. No one mentioned it, I'm quite surprised. This is Europe's day. This is, uh, this is the big celebration uh, of the European Union. And uh, in lunchtime, we had a nice gathering organized by the delegation of the European Commission in London, and I was invited there. And I walked around and I told to many friends and colleagues there that I was going to come here and uh, have a, a speech about the future of EU. And I told them that I will be on the proposition side. And they were like, are you sure? <laughs> I mean, they know that uh, what uh, my government's position in many of the uh, controversies uh, in Brussels. And I, it's not to say that I have a complete dispute with some of the uh, uh, points that the opposition made about the current state of play in Brussels, but the motion actually talks about the future of the EU and representing a country that is about to take over the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union in just a little more than, a little le less than two months time, of course it is our job uh, and it is our duty to believe in the bright future uh, of uh, the EU because the EU, of course, is a, is a human project. Its future, its performance, its functioning is actually the outcome of the behavior of the choices of the people who are forging the operation. Voters, prime ministers, commissioners, everyone who is involved. And as such, it's a huge question how it's going to work. Uh, but if we can stay true to the vision of the founding fathers, so many references have been made today, that, uh, I guess that uh, relying uh, on those basic ideas, basic dreams, that it was first of all a peace project, uh, a democratic project, and I will get back to the many criticism that was uh, uh, addressed to the democracy aspect of the project, and the prosperity aspect, we can really believe in a bright future for the EU. So let me dwell on these three points, peace, democracy, and prosperity. First on peace. Uh, the, the founding fathers really find a way on the ruins uh, of the worst, most devastating armed conflict uh, of our mankind to bring peace to this continent, and they were successful in that, no doubt about this. This was the, the big challenge of our grandparents, so to say. Uh, jumping ahead in time, uh, after the end of the Cold War, the start of the reunification uh, of the European continent was a big challenge of my parents' generation, roughly say, and the big enlargement uh, with which my country also joined the bloc was a, an excellent, excellent example for that. And it is our generation's challenge and task to complete this reunification. If you look at the map of Europe, if you look at the missing countries, and first and foremost, I would concentrate on our immediate neighborhood, the Western Balkans. Uh, many prepared countries are waiting there for the accession. And uh, for them, the average waiting time since their candidacy started is getting to be 15 years. We've spent, Central European countries who were fortunate enough to join the bloc in 20 years ago, we spent 10 years in the waiting room. And, and as I can recall that 10 years, it, it felt like a lot of time. It felt, felt like eternity. So we really need to concentrate a lot on the enlargement because enlargement, consequence en enlargement in the history of the EU brought stability to those countries who joined the bloc. Go ahead. Doesn't enlargement just create less flexibility? Well, that's a question. That's not a factual thing. <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't enlargement just create more people, more voices, more division? 27, 28 countries? No, no. OK, good. Thank you. Uh, I will get back to that. So uh, what we have experienced in the, in, 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 in the consequent enlargements is that Many of the countries who actually uh, came out from crisis, from 
communism, as in our case, uh, the accession could bring stability and, uh, and, 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 uh, and a new, new hope for many of these. I'm not talking about the enlargement in 73, okay, you were not in crisis probably beforehand, but uh, for many it was a, a big stability factor. So now we have, we are at the crossroads, how to deal with the rest of the continent and how to deal with these countries. They need a credible uh, 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 promise uh, to have a, a kind of uh, accession point in the near future. And this is why my country and the, and the priorities of our presidency, we're going to have a lot of emphasis on the enlargement aspect uh, of the story. Uh, let me jump to the, uh, to the democracy aspect. Uh, many has been sad on the lacking uh, democracy aspect uh, of uh, the whole uh, operation of the EU. Um, and it's, of course, fair to say that if we alone look at the European Parliament as the only directly elected body of the European uh, Union, uh, it's, it's probably not enough to represent all the wills uh, and all the wishes of the Europeans, European voters, if you like. Yes, we are heading towards an election exactly in one month's time. We're going to vote all Europeans uh, in favor of some sort of uh, representation in this particular institution. Uh, but alone, you know, if we have a problem with the functioning of our existing institutions in the EU, in Brussels, generally speaking, this will be an opportunity for the European voters to speak, to tell if they are happy with what they have seen so far, or if they want to have a new direction. And if they want to have a new direction, which could very easily be the case, because this is how a democracy works, then they will speak and we will have a new direction. We will have new people, new faces, new members of the Commission, new president of the Commission maybe, who knows. Uh, but there's another layer of democracy. We tend to forget about that, but those are the national democracies themselves. And you will often hear, when you hear anyone representing the Hungarian government and the member states, the national level, the strong nations within the European Union, are the most important building bricks of the strong European Union itself. So I would also drag your attention to the, to the, to the most functional democratic control that is in the member states, in its own national democracies themselves. So when the people uh, of the respective member states are not happy with the functioning of the EU, they will also express this, you know, disappointment in their national uh, democratic elections and the way uh, the things we look. And we've heard, uh, uh, you know, my prime minister has been mentioned twice, uh, not probably in the best light, but uh, I guess that simply the upcoming political changes in the European democracies will reflect on the opinion of the European people of all the affairs, including what is going on in Brussels, and the outcome probably is not pleasing for many who are currently uh, in Brussels, uh, who are in leading positions. But we, never, we should never forget that the only directly or the only democratically uh, legitimate uh, players in, the, in forging the, the EU's future uh, are the members of the European Parliament first, but also the prime ministers and the presidents in the council. Uh, and probably they play an even uh, more important role in that. And if there will be different kinds of, of prime ministers and presidents in the Council of the European Union, then it will be a different future for the, for the European Union. That is how democracy has a constant feedback on the actual functioning of the European Union. And that is uh, why I can say that if something goes to the wrong direction, its inherent democratic control and feedback will just lead us back to the, to the right way. Oh. Go ahead. Do you not think the fact that in the council with the individual leaders of states, the fact that anyone can veto any one bill of Parliament, do you not think that that will be the act of barriers? Very good question. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. It, yes. I guess it's a very important point because uh, having disputes in the council or just, just between the member states is the most important aspect of the functioning and the democratic functioning of the European Union. I don't need to explain, I guess, in this chamber where the dispute and, and sometimes you know, harsh uh, opposition ideas are just forging uh, some, probably the true something that, that leads to the right direction. And this is why we shouldn't be afraid of, uh, of very different ideas about the future uh, of the EU themselves. And this is why it is a dangerous idea to bring qualified majority voting into the functioning of the Council. And I would say, I have a memory, I, I was 
raised in the communist Hungary. And I remember how the, the, the so-called union of the Soviet bloc worked. We had a dominant Soviet Union sitting in the, in the heart of it. And the others could have an idea, could have different views and visions, but the dominant center could always suppress their will. And we don't want to be there anymore. And this is the beauty of the European Union. So we should stick with the veto power of every single member state. And this is not a problem in the enlargement. We should have a way to find unity, common understanding of the, of the good direction. And this is how democracy will stay with the European Union. And let me, let me dwell on my final point, uh, prosperity. Uh, for prosperity, we need competition internally as well between uh, the member states. Uh, but competition can only be fair if there's somewhat level playing field between the member states. That's why cohesion policy that was in favor uh, of the Central European countries that accessed a little more than 20 years ago should remain, should serve this very important goal to provide a well-functioning common market. Uh, but, uh, no, sorry, I'm running out of time. Uh, so, and another factor is, of course, for prosperity, we need to maintain the human resources, the people uh, of uh, our union, all the countries. And in that respect, we should uh, put more emphasis on demography to see the demographic uh, uh, trends that are quite scaring. And that's why the Hungarian presidency will put a lot of emphasis on family policies, how we can bring about uh, change in demography and also a well-managed control of illegal migration and to crack down the criminal gangs who are dealing with human trafficking and causing a lot of problems on our borders, also in Hungary and on the other side of the continent as well. So with that, let me just say that if we say, stay true to these ideals and if we try to keep the peace, democracy and prosperity uh, goals in the equation, the EU indeed has a bright future. But of course, it's not inevitable. We have to work on that and we have to listen to the people and to the will of the European voters. Thank you so much.